We're on the week three, the commandment three of the Ten Commandments, and showing that they're relevant to our lives today in the 21st century in the United States. And we're talking about how holy the name of God is. Uh, that last song we sang, Proverbs 18, says, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it, and they are safe. So we're talking about how holy God's name is. Now, what if you were to hear the mention of the name of your father or your mother? What thoughts would immediately enter into your mind? What kind of emotions would you be experiencing? When you hear a familiar name, any name that's familiar, thoughts and associations come to the forefront in our minds. For example, when Steeler fans hear the name of Cincinnati linebacker Vontes Burfecht, I don't think they get warm, fuzzy feelings. They immediately have negative thoughts. What pops into your mind when you hear President Ronald Reagan's name, or Billy Graham, or Adolf Hitler, or Osama bin Laden, uh, Winston Churchill? How about Sidney Crosby, or Lance Armstrong? When we hear those names, we have certain thoughts that we entertain in our minds. We have specific memories or associations, and we often have certain emotions. Why? Because those names represent something we know about that specific individual. They, they represent who that individual is, what they've done or what they've failed to do, how they've lived their lives, and their names are a summary to you of all that that individual stands for. As a pastor, one of the highlights of my ministry is to be able to dedicate little children and their parents to the Lord. It's a privilege to hold the little one before the Lord and before this congregation and speak the name of that child. Most of the time, they're all kind of unique names, names that we never heard when we were growing up. I had one that was born on 777, and they named it Liberty. I think her middle name was Bell. So Liberty Bell, I'm like, okay, that was a unique name. Some of the names are biblical. Caleb, Joshua, Esther, Samuel, Sarah. Some parents are intentional. They look up the name and its meaning, and they're intentional in giving that name to their child. I like to think that's true of my parents when they named me David, because if you look up the name David, it means beloved. I like to think my parents said, our son's beloved. I don't know. I haven't asked. My mom, I'm not going to ask her, might burst my bubble, and she might say, we weren't thinking that at all. We just like the name David. People's names represent something. A name represents who they are and possibly, in a prophetic sense, who they might become. God was so concerned about the name of a person and what it meant in biblical times that there were occasions when he himself named an individual. He told Joseph, you shall name the child that Mary's going to give birth to Jesus because he shall save his people from their sins. The name Jesus is a derivative of Joshua, which means the Lord saves. Sometimes God changed the name of individuals at key moments in their life. When the character changed or was about to change, God renamed them. In Genesis chapter 17, God said to Abram, your name will no longer be Abram, which means exalted father. Now I'm going to call you Abraham, which means the father of a multitude or a father of many people. In John 4, 1, uh, 42, when Jesus stood before Simon, he said, your name right now is Simon. But from here on out, you shall be called Cephas or Peter, which means rock. And Peter was a strong leader in the early church. It was Peter who preached on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 in Jerusalem, and 3,000 souls were brought to Jesus Christ. That was the birth of the church. Jesus knew when he called Peter that he was temperamental, and he often spoke out of turn, spoke off the cuff, spoke impulsively, spoke before he thought. He also knew, he was well aware, that there was coming a day when Peter would deny that he even knew Jesus three times. But Jesus also saw in Simon tremendous potential to do great things for the cause of Christ. Peter would be changed from the inside out, from a wishy-washy, unreliable man who in his cowardice denied he knew Jesus. Peter would be turned into a man who stood firm and was willing to take a stand for the cause of Christ regardless of the cost. When a person 
gives his life or her life to Jesus Christ for salvation, that individual's name is written down in the Lamb's book of life. And that Lamb's book of life is talked about in Revelation 13, verse 8. If a name represents a person's character and a person's reputation, and that name is very important to God, then let's ask this question. Why is there so much profanity today? Why do so many people in the United States care, uh, casually, carefully, uh, care freely, and dis- disrespectfully, uh, irreverently speak God's name? Why is that if a name's important? We can understand why this might be a, a great issue of importance to the Lord. But why did He make it one of the Ten Commandments? Why did he give that severe warning in verse 7 that if a man takes my name in vain, he will not be held guiltless? I believe it's because God fully understands what can and will and does happen if we become careless in tossing his name around. And I'm saddened to say that you and I live today in an air, in a period that the air is blue with profanity. You can scarcely watch a TV show or go to a movie or read a book or even listen to the radio without someone taking God's name in vain. That word profane can be defined as debasing or defiling that which is holy or worthy of reverence. Profanity is an attack against something that should be held in highest esteem that we should treasure, that we should cherish. Profanity is defiling something that we look on upon with awe. It's an attempt to take something that's exalted, revered, and smear it or remove it from its high place. So essentially when I profane something, what I'm doing is I'm attempting to bring it down to my level so that I can bring that person or that thing and reduce it to being nothing more than what I am. So what exactly does it mean then to profane profane the name of the Lord? Essentially, to profane God's name is to deny His holiness and His majesty and His power. It's an attempt to pull God down to a common level and to make Him our peer. But know this. Such a practice is a grave and a most serious error. Now, there are those people in society, unfortunately, who can't stand to think that there might be someone who's higher or loftier than they are. On a much smaller scale, just stop and consider how many people seem to take some sick pleasure or delight or they relish in seeing celebrities brought down by misfortune, by mistakes. Sometimes I read comments on ESPN articles that talk about the demise, the fall of a once greatly respected, revered athlete. The commentators in those articles, they write in, and they're people just like you and me, and they're often quick to express glee in the mishap of the fallen individual. Instead of feeling sorry for that individual, they take a delight in it. The world seems to get a particular thrill when a prominent pastor or a Christian leader falls. And the sentiment of these people is, looky here. See what I've been telling you? That's what I've been saying. Those people, that pastor, that leader in the church, that leader in Christianity, he's no different. She's no different than me. They're just like me. The only difference is this, I don't go to church, and I don't profess to have faith. But you see, they fell, and they're just like me. When we choose to use profane language, or we choose to curse, we essentially destroy the concept of a high and a holy God who reigns above and over all of us. We've somehow, by using profane language, convince ourselves that we can take this God, we can take this God who appears to be holy, and we can reduce Him to just mere mortality. 
And if we head down this path, then the logical end result would be that there's absolutely nothing in the universe anymore that is sacred or holy. And that's where we are in America. I think there's a show coming out. Uh, I think it's its second season. I'm glad I missed the first season. It's called Impastor. And I watch that and I'm going, good grief. It says it's irreverent. And it's, people think it's funny. And I'm thinking, why are we watching something like that? It smears people that are trying to serve the Lord. It seems to me that's where this path we're traveling in America. There's nothing off limits. There's nothing sacred. There's nothing reverent. There's nothing holy. And unless you live in a monastery or you've been holed up all week long, you'll most likely hear the word damn several times in one week. Now stop and think about that term. What does that mean? It literally means condemned to a particular fate. People seem willing, eager to condemn anything and everything, anyone and everyone. We hear people say, it's GD this and GD this, GD my phone, my GD boss, my GD back problems. It's so common to many people, those words are as common as breathing. And I'm convinced of this. People have really no clue as to what they're actually saying and just how often they're using that type of language. So the question is this, does it matter? Does it matter to God? Let me tell you how much it matters to the Lord. He made it one of the Ten Commandments. You shall not take my name in vain. Why did he include that? Because God is well aware that every time those phrases, those terms are spoken, incredible destruction enters our lives and the lives of the people that we love. When you don't put God first, when you don't honor His holy name, life just doesn't work. It does matter when we use God's name in vain. When we say GD and the like, rest assured that talk doesn't fall on deaf ears. Turn with me to the Gospel of uh, Matthew chapter 12. If you don't have a Bible, there should be one in the pew directly in front of you. And Jesus is speaking in Matthew 12. And we're going to look at, first of all, verse 36 and 37. And we'll look at a couple other verses, but maybe you want to mark chapter 12. Here's what Jesus said in Matthew 12, 36 and 37. I tell you that men will have to give an account on the day of judgment for every careless word they've spoken. And if you read Romans 14, 12, every man, every woman, every person is going to give an account of their life before God. I'm going to answer for myself. You're going to answer for yourself before God. For every careless word, we're held accountable. For by your words, you'll be acquitted. And by your words, you will be condemned. Why would God say, don't take my name in vain? Because remember, we said in Deuteronomy 10, 12, and 13, these Ten Commandments are for our good. God didn't give them to us to be a killjoy, to put a vice on us, put us in some grip. He loves you and me so much. And the problem with many people was this. They've duped themselves into believing, I can say whatever I want and get away with it. I've heard people say, well, you know what? I've been using that language for years and nothing's happened to me yet. So obviously, God, if he even does exist, he doesn't seem to mind. He hasn't lifted a finger to discipline me or correct me. But Paul said in Galatians 6, 7, and 8, listen, God will not be mocked. How a man sows is also how he will reap. If you sow to the flesh, you'll reap to the flesh. And if you sow to the Spirit, you'll reap to the Spirit. Just keep this in mind. If you think you're getting away with it, you don't necessarily reap in the same season that you've sown. But know this, that using God's name in vain will affect your life in adverse ways. I've said this many times. God's given us a free will. 
you can say, I choose to take his name in vain. It's my life. It's my mouth. I can say what I want. And God gives you that freedom. But you're not free, and I'm not free, to dictate or determine the consequence of those decisions. Know this. There's power in the name of Jesus. There's a song that says there's power in the name of Jesus to break every chain. Break every chain that holds us prisoner in life. So let me ask you, point blank today, do you believe that there's power in the name of Jesus? Do you believe that the demons scream and they writhe at the mention of His name? The Bible tells us in the authority of Jesus' voice, in the authority of His name, the eyes of the blind were open, the lame were enabled to walk, and dead bodies left the grave. So why, would we, why wouldn't we believe there are consequences to the manner in which we use the Lord's name? Here's the news. There are good consequences for using God's name properly. And there are unwanted consequences for using God's name irreverently or casually. When you and I know this, when you and I say GD to someone, here's what we're saying, communicating. May God send you to a destructive eternity in hell. That's exactly what you're saying. And I'm convinced of this. The vast majority of people who use that phraseology have no idea what they're actually saying when they invoke God's name like that. As followers of Jesus, you and I are to revere our Savior's name because there's incredible power in it. God understands that the words I utter will tend to affect what I actually experience in life. Keep your finger there in Matthew 12, but turn toward the front of your Bibles to Psalm 61. And the Psalms are almost in the middle of your Bible. In verse 5, there, there's a great need to revere God's name. And I want to read for you what David said in Psalm 61.5. He said, and he's praying to the Lord, You have heard my vows, O God, and you have given me the heritage of those who fear your name. David is declaring that for all those who fear, revere the name of the Lord, who love His name and who honor His name, the Lord gives them a great heritage. It's the same heritage of all those who have honored God's name through the passage of time. It's a heritage of tremendous blessing and honor. It's a heritage of fruitfulness and, and fruitful life and a lasting impact. And it's a heritage of unspeakable joy. Now think about it this morning. How could we not honor God? How could we possibly dishonor the very source of all our blessing? For that matter, how could we stand idly by while His name is being tossed around in a blatantly wrong fashion? I wonder how any of us could possibly condone our watching a movie or reading a book where the name of God is defamed. And yet, we subject ourselves knowingly to movies like that. And we become desensitized where people say, Pastor, you ought to go rent this video. It's good. I didn't, you ought to go see this movie in the theater. I don't think there's anything bad in it. And you Google it, and you can find out why it's rated PG-13 or why it's rated R, and it'll say uh, five GDs and two Jesus Christ. And, and it's like, you don't remember that part of the movie? No, because we got desensitized. How could we become that way? I've read on numerous occasions where a major brawl breaks out somewhere because someone there uttered a disparaging remark about some guy's wife or his girlfriend or his mother. I've seen people, athletes, say, you know what? Fans can taunt me. But when they start making it about my mother or my wife, they've crossed the line. I'm going after them. There have been athletes that have gone up into the stands because people taunted or spoke ill of their loved one. Names are important. Certainly the name above all names, Philippians 2.9, is important. We'll talk more about it, but in Philippians 2 it says, verse 9, that God has given Jesus the name above all names that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. Always remember 
There is salvation. There's eternal life in the name of Jesus. John 20, 31, John said, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you might have eternal life. Acts 4.12, Peter stood before the religious leaders and he was talking about Jesus and he said, there's no other name than the name of Jesus given among men whereby we must be saved. So how can you and I profane that name? How can we deliberately expose ourselves to someone else profaning that precious name? What do you think would happen if you were in an Islamic country and they spoke the name of Allah in an irreverent fashion? Or they spoke the name of their prophet, Muhammad, in an irreverent fashion? You wouldn't last long. You'd be executed. Picture in your mind a horrible darkness that's filled with despair and agony and loneliness and fear and death itself. And then picture this open door, a door that leads into life and hope and joy and beauty and healing. Now, can you imagine someone callously spitting on that door or throwing excrement or feces on that door? Or could you imagine someone taking a spray can and painting that door with tasteless graffiti? Jesus is the door. He said in John 10, I am the door. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father but by me. You cannot have a relationship with the Holy God except through faith in Jesus Christ. He is the world's only hope. In fact, Paul said in Ephesians 2.12, if you are without Christ, you're without God and you're without hope. He put it another way in Colossians 1.27 where he said, Christ living in us, that's the hope of glory. There's no other hope. There's no other means of salvation. And it's this door that you and I dare to treat with contempt. And I've heard people say, well, pastor, I just need to tell you something that'll explain why my language is a little rough. I grew up in a home where that language was spoken. Or when I was in high school, I was in the locker room and all the kids talk like that. And my coaches talk like that. Or I was in the military. My home wasn't like that, but when I got in the military, I learned new words. Or I went to college. Or you ought to be in my workplace, because that's all people ever use is that kind of language. And we try to excuse ourselves sometimes by saying, okay, pastor. Okay, God, I'll admit I use your name in vain in a proper manner, but is that really that big of a deal? And we try to convince ourselves and others that what comes out of our mouth is really no reflection or indication of what's in our hearts. Know this. The Bible always links what comes out of our mouths with what's in our hearts. Jesus said that very thing time after time. And I'm just going to reference two of them in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 34. Jesus was talking to the religious leaders and he said this to them. You brood of vipers, you snakes, how can you who are evil say anything good? And then he made it clear, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. And if you go to chapter 15, in verse 18, Jesus said, it's the things that come out of the mouth come from the heart, and these make a man unclean. It starts in our heart. The fact is, whether you like it or not, the mouth, our speech, reveals what's in our hearts. The way you and our, I talk is because of the condition of our heart. And the Lord knows that's the case. You can't poo-poo things like I hear people saying sometimes, well, <laughs> yeah, she has a potty mouth, but she has a good heart. Or he has an obvious problem with filthy language, but he really has a heart of gold. I'm sorry, but the Bible's our final authority. And that excuse doesn't wash with God. God's Word makes it very clear that the way an individual speaks is an accurate measure of his or her heart. Now, I want to read toward the back of your Bibles in James chapter 3, great chapter on the power of the tongue, James chapter 3, verses 8 
to 12. And James said this, No man can tame the tongue. The tongue is a restless evil. It's full of deadly poison. And then he said, think about it. With the tongue, we praise our Lord. We sing in church. We praise His name. We praise our Lord and Father. And with our same tongue, we curse men who were made in the image of God or in God's likeness. Verse 10, out of the same mouth come praise and cursing. My brothers, this should not be. Can both fresh water and salt water flow from the same spring? My brothers, can a fig tree bear olives? No. Or a grapevine bear figs? No. Neither can a salt spring produce fresh water. So any bitter, hurtful, or profane speech coming from my mouth, that's an indication that there's something terribly amiss, something wrong in my heart. Most of us, at one time or other, we have spewed out venomous, hurt-filled words. And we've even surprised ourselves and we say, where in the world did that come from? Or we say, oh my, that's not appropriate. And then we try to go into damage control by toning down our words. Listen, if bitter words come out of your mouth, that should be an awareness that there's bitterness lurking in your heart. And if I speak profane words, that's a, a demonstration that there's still impurity in my heart. And it should serve as a wake-up call. It would do me some good to find a place where I can get alone with God and pray Psalm 139, 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and show me. Show me my speech. And if I'm taking your name in vain, show me, Lord. Is God at all concerned with what you and I say? Absolutely. If there's a problem with our speech, God's well aware that there's more than just speech that's problematic. Poor, improper speech, I'm not talking about poor grammar, I'm talking about poor usage of words that grieves the Lord is symptomatic of an even greater problem. It's an issue with the inner man. And before you dismiss the notion that you would ever use improper speech by saying, well, I don't have that kind of problem, and you know what? I'd never say what they'd say. I'd never do that. I'd never take the Lord's name in vain by saying GD or anything closely remote to that. Let me say a few things. First, say by the grace of God I would never do that. Because Paul said in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 1, 10 to 12, let him who thinks he stand take heed lest he fall. Second, know this, you might not say GD, but there are other ways to speak God's name in vain. We can do that by mindlessly praying the exact words over and over to the point that we no longer are focused on God. Jesus said, avoid vain repetition. You can learn a prayer, and it might even be a good prayer but you're just saying it over and over. You're no longer connecting with God. Years ago, I was in a locker room, and the team was praying the Lord's Prayer, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. When they finished the prayer, one of the kids goes, let's go out and beat the out of them. Wow. Our Father who art in heaven, holy is your name. Now we're going to go out, and we're start using expletives as soon as the prayer is over. I think some people look at these rote prayers as a rabbit foot. And listen, your own prayer can become rote. You, you didn't read it in the Bible. You, didn't, you weren't taught it in church, but you just keep saying the same words. That's that vain repetition. And when we pray in Jesus' name, sometimes we think, well, if I just use Jesus' name, I'll get whatever I ask for. We should be convinced when we're saying in your name, Jesus, that everything that we just asked for is what Jesus himself would be praying if he were petitioning our Heavenly Father. Before I close my prayer in Jesus' name, I should ask myself, Dave, is what I just prayed in accordance with God's perfect will and would my Savior request similar things? There's a recent pool that revealed that 60% of Americans confess, admit, acknowledge that they have used the Lord's name in vain. But I think that percentage is probably closer to 100%. There have been those times 
when we use Jesus' name in prayer, but quite frankly, it was a selfish prayer. It was not a God-honoring prayer. We desired something that most likely wasn't what God wanted us to have. And we pray sometimes out of selfish motives. Others of us who profess to be followers of Jesus, we become so accustomed to speaking His name that we somehow end up comfortable tossing around in some carefree, careless, or joking manner. I've heard people say, oh, my God. And they're not saying, oh, my God, you're holy, you're precious, I love you. Or I've heard people say, good God Almighty. And they're not really meaning good God Almighty. It's obvious they're not really talking to Him. And listen to me. I'm not here to point the finger at anyone. I'm simply saying that every one of us needs to do some soul-searching and prayerful evaluation of how the Lord, how we use His name in our speech. Because Paul said, listen, His name, Jesus' name, is above every name, and someday every one of us is going to bow before Him and declare that You are Lord. We sing songs, there's power in the name of Jesus The old hymn says, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's something about that name. Take the name of Jesus with you, precious name. We sing, blessed be your name. This is the name, Jesus, that gives us life and salvation. So have you and I become too cozy and carefree with that holy name? In the prayer that Jesus offered as a model for us, he instructed his disciples to begin by praying, our Father who art in heaven, what? Hallowed, holy, sacred is your name. When you understand and appreciate, even in some small way, the holiness of God, it's virtually impossible and inconceivable to, for us to utter God's name in a careless way. When you come to understand at all what the Lord has done for you and how He's blessed you, you won't speak His name casually. Not when you acknowledge the tremendous price that He paid for your salvation. I'll just give you one biblical example that illustrates what I've said. In Isaiah 6, the prophet Isaiah got a glimpse of God's holiness, God's majesty, God's glory, and he heard the angels exclaiming, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The God of angelic beings, Chris Tomlin sang, the God of angel armies. That's the Lord of hosts is always by my side. Isaiah's immediate response was to cry out, Woe is me! I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips. And he was freely admitting that he had said some unclean things, things that were unworthy of a child of God to say. Now think about it. Could you ever envision an angel in the presence of the Lord taking God's name casually. You ever think that would happen? In the presence of God, an angel throwing around the name of God in a carefree way? Definitely not. So I say that you and I should learn from the angels how to revere and honor the name of God. And as we close, I want to offer you three practical steps of response to what we've considered this morning. Number one, pray Psalm 139, 23, and 24. Lord, show me if my speech has dishonored you and I've used your name in an ungodly way, in a way that grieves you. And guess what? When you pray that, God will show you if you've done that. And that word confess literally means, Lord, I agree. I've used your name in a way that's not pleasing to you. And then when you acknowledge that, express godly sorrow because 2 Corinthians 7.10 says a godly sorrow leads to repentance. So, Lord, I've used your name in an improper manner. Lord, I'm sorry for that. You're such a great God. You're such a great Savior. Please forgive me. Step two, accept this forgiveness. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. After you've expressed godly sorrow and you've sought God's mercy and forgiveness, accept that forgiveness. Because... Here's what Satan likes to do. He likes to keep throwing it back in your face and saying, how could you forget about that? You need to say, you know what? The blood of Christ cleanses me from all sin. 
The Bible says, as far as the east is from the west, that's how far he's removed my sin. I asked the Lord to forgive me. He's forgiven me. He's not throwing it up. Satan, you are, and I'm not going to keep dwelling on that. He took all your sins, your past sins, your present sins, your future sins on his body as he hung on the cross. He incurred, he suffered the wrath of God so that we might be forgiven. Christ suffered once. He died once for us, the unrighteous, to bring us to God. So accept his forgiveness. And finally, practice his presence. Hebrews 4.13 says, Everything is naked and open before him with whom we have to do. Psalm 139, 7 to 10 says, No matter where I go, Lord, you're there. God has promised in uh, Hebrews 13, 5, He'll never leave us, never forsake us. Practicing His presence should impact your speech. I love the fact that while we have all definitely sinned and we've all made grievous mistakes, including some things we wish we hadn't said, God says this to us, if you will humble yourself and you will come before me, I will make you clean. I'll erase all those things in your past, and I'll give you hope and joy for the future. That's how much God loves us. He said, I love you with an everlasting love. And I want to close with Psalm 130 in verses 3 and 4. Here's what the psalmist says. Think about this. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? If you just kept track of my sins... Who could stand? But with you, there's forgiveness. And therefore, you are feared or revered. Lord, if you just kept our sin and you never forgave us, none of us could stand before you. But the beautiful truth is, the gospel message is that you have forgiven us when we come to you. And so you should be revered. You should be worshiped. We're free because of what Jesus did on the cross for us. We're free to love and to serve and revere our wonderful God. Let us pray. So our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. I want to ask you, do you know God can... You say, He's my Father. Jesus is my Savior. If you're sure of that, thank God for that. But maybe there's one or more here that say, I can't say I have a personal relationship with God. I can't say the Lord is my shepherd. I can't say that God's my father. I can't say that Jesus is my savior, but I want to be able to say that. Then you can say that by praying a prayer similar to this. It's not a magic potion in the words. It's the intent of your heart, but a prayer similar to this in the quietness of your own heart. Dear Lord Jesus, today I admit I agree that I'm a sinner. And I know you went to the cross and you shed your blood and gave your life to pay for my sin. I'm sorry for my sin. Jesus, I'm asking you to forgive me and to cleanse me. I'm inviting you into my life to be my Savior. And I want to walk with you as my master from this moment on. Thank you for saving me. As our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, if you prayed that prayer today, just ask you to slip your hand. I'm not going to point you out in any fashion. Yes, are there any others? Yes. You may put your hands on. Are there any others? Yes. Perhaps there are those who say, I'm a child of God. I want to ask Him to make me aware of His abiding presence. I want Him to give me complete victory over using His name in any irreverent fashion. Would you pray for me that I might practice this third commandment, Pastor? Yes, many hands. Father, I thank You that You're a holy God. I thank You that You're a loving God, a merciful God that you have not dealt with us according to our sin, or none of us would be here. But, Lord, I thank you that there's forgiveness with you and grace and mercy. Lord, I thank you for your name. It is holy. It is sacred. I thank you for the name of Jesus, whereby we can be saved. And I thank you someday every one of us in here is going to bow before Jesus and proclaim you are Lord. And I pray, Lord, that it wouldn't be too late for anyone. And they wouldn't hear Jesus say, depart from me because I never knew you. Lord, I ask you to tame our tongues because James said we can't do it. But it also says in your word, I can do all things through Christ. So, Lord, help us with our speech. May we never take your name for granted. And if we do, Lord, if we use it in vain, may we confess that immediately. 
and seek and accept your forgiveness. Lord, we love you. We pray that you dismiss us with your blessing. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great week. God bless you.